This is a narrative about hope and courage, as well as the unconditional love that exists between a mother and her kid. Rooting for Rona, our hope that the rest of the world would come to know Rona as we did, as the bravest little girl whose will to live surpassed all odds has now come true. The entire experience from the moment I saw her sorrowful portrait for the first time to ultimately meeting Runa is still clear in my memory. I recall the exact moment I first saw Runa's face, my first featured documentary. Indelible about the lives of seven people with Down syndrome was nearing completion on the 13th of April 2013, and I was in the final steps of finishing it. When I came into Runa, I was going through my newsfeed. The first article had been authored by a journalistic acquaintance of mine. A visceral response sprang from within me. My heart was broken by the photograph. Since then, several people have inquired as to why we selected to follow Runa's journey. I don't have a great response, but I'd compare it to falling in love, something that was both unfathomable and unavoidable at the same time. A ray of hope was found its way to the most unlikely of people in the most unlikely of settings. We reason that if hope can be brought to Runa, then perhaps it can be brought to the millions of other children who are born with a birth defect and do not have access to competent medical care. The following day, we boarded a flight to Gurgaon, where we would meet Runa. It's almost as if the cosmos orchestrated an incredible series of circumstances to ensure that Runa's tale reached as many people as possible. Runa was born in a small village called Geranya Kolo, which is located near Argartalia in the state of Tripura, the result of a birth abnormality known as hydrocephalus, which is characterized by a buildup of fluid in the brain. Her head swelled to an unprecedented size of 94 centimeters by the time she was 17 months old, making her the youngest person ever to do so. And Aaron Dam Day, a photojournalist who was shooting in the neighborhood, Rick Kilns at the time, snapped the first photographs of Runa that would go viral in less than 24 hours. An incredible series of events followed as a result of this. Fortis Hospital in Gurgaon, India, agreed to treat Runa after receiving an outpouring of support from around the world. The first time we met Runa and her parents, Abdul and Fatima was at the newly inaugurated Fortis Memorial Research Institute in Gurgaon, where we had to fight our way through scores of media and photographers to catch their attention. When I first saw her, it took me a few moments to realize what I was looking at. It was impossible to ignore the enormous size of her head, which utterly dwarfed her diminutive frame. I've never witnessed such a combination of vulnerability and incredible strength as what occurred at Runa. No one, let alone a little girl, should have to go through something like this. Her parents, Abdul, 17, and Fatima, 22, were only able to communicate in Bengali. They appeared to be terrified by the media attention, but they also appeared to be extremely protective of their son. At that moment, all our communication was nonverbal, but I could tell that Fatima was taking a mental inventory of the group. We were, after all, complete strangers. Why should she put her faith in us? Little Runa was given the opportunity to live a normal life while recovering from hydrocephalus, and as a consequence, she and her family formed a special bond that will last a lifetime. Runa underwent five procedures over the course of the following five months. Dr. Sandi Vaishya, her lead neurosurgeon, was always cautiously optimistic about her prognosis. This was particularly admirable because no one else seemed to be willing to give her a chance. During this period, Fatima and I began to form a bond that was continued to this day. Ananya Roy, our assistant director, was fluent in the dialect of the people we were working with. Fatima began to regard us as friends and confidence after a period of time. She would be completely honest with us about her concerns, anger, and hopes. I could tell she was a mother who was willing to go to any length for her son or daughter. Runa's head size decreased dramatically in just five months, going from 94 centimeters to 58 centimeters. Her chief surgeon provided us with a really encouraging prognosis. The hope was that Runa would be able to lift her head and possibly, following another surgery down the road, walk. But that never happened. The day she was released from the hospital was a particularly memorable one for her. Her parents were relieved to find that their child was not in pain, and they were also relieved to be able to bring her back home to all she had grown accustomed to. We accompanied the three of them on the trip and on the ride back to their home in New York. It was a hero's welcome. 
The entire hamlet, as well as the entire world's press, was in attendance. There were lots of wide smiles all around, and a general sense of warmth and thankfulness permeated the atmosphere. It appeared as though everyone had gained something. Runa appeared to be in a better mood when she encountered her in 2014. We spent a significant amount of time examining the bond that developed between Runa and Fatima. Our investigation into the local medical infrastructure helped us to comprehend how Runa's disability came to be, in addition to recording their everyday lives. A meeting with Runa's family was arranged when we were successful in tracking down the doctor who delivered the baby. We were also able to complete the process of obtaining her birth certificate. This was a significant milestone for both our family and ourselves. Runa's spirit was constantly loud and active, despite the fact that she was unable to communicate. We were able to recognize her, even though the doctors were unsure if she would see us, and she would break into a smile whenever we spoke to her. These insignificant details provided us with all the motivation we required to keep things going. Runa's condition was improving, so we put things in motion to help get her better. This included scheduling medical appointments for her and keeping track of her progress and recovery. We also negotiated with the hospital for her care and made sure she had access to all medication and vaccines that were available to her. Following the birth of Runa's younger brother, Abdul, the family welcomed another member into the fold, and the decision to proceed with the final surgery was questioned due to the significant risk involved. In 2016, we received word of a delightful surprise for our group of friends. Fatima had given birth to a healthy baby boy, Akhtar Hussein, who had been named after his father. When we arrived, though, there was a noticeable sense of tension between Abdul and Fatima. Fatima had began feeling the burden of trying to care for both Runa and Akhtar, and it had taken a toll on her. Our main aim during this time was to persuade both of Runa's parents to return to Gurgaon for the last surgical procedure. We'd been in frequent contact with her doctor, who had made it plain that we were wasting precious time by not acting quickly. It appeared to both Fatima and Abdul that proceeding with the surgery would be fraught with danger because the physicians were providing them with no assurances about the outcome. They were concerned that they would lose Runa when she was on the surgery table. Despite the fact that we found it exceedingly difficult to accept, we were clear in our minds that the decisions would have to be made by the parents in the end. Fatima requested that we return in February this year. Akhtar was now a rambunctious one-year-old, and they were concerned that Runa's condition had plateaued at this point. They were finally prepared to transport her to the hospital for the final surgery. In May 2017, Fatima and Runa joined us on a trip to Delhi for a medical examination. I was apprehensive about what was going to happen. As soon as we arrived, the physicians discovered that Runa had contacted chickenpox and had to be hospitalized. Despite the significant delay, Dr. Vasha informed us that the procedure would still be possible to complete. He had a ray of hope for her. Fatima was ecstatic with the news. When she returned as a month for the final procedure, she was urged to return as soon as Runa recovered from chickenpox. A huge setback occurred after a great deal of urging and persuading to take a chance on something new. On the 18th of June, Rune suffered from sudden and unexpected breathing difficulties and passed away at her home. We received the feared phone call from Abdul around 8.10 p.m. on that fateful night. The sense of bereavement was overwhelming. The news hit us like a punch in the gut since we'd been feeling the most hopeful for her in that one month, so close to her perhaps being able to walk. We were lucky enough to be present with her, her family, and her entire village as the final rites were done at sunset in Gerania the following morning, as we were on the first flight to Tripura that morning. The entire group worked in complete silence. We made a covenant in our sadness that her beautiful life would not have been in vain, and that now, more than ever, we would stand up for Runa and fight for her rights. Thanks for watching. Please like and share the video in social networks. We'll be right back to you as fast as we can.